all of us give thanks to you and we're very thankful for the Lord that that you are who you are and we love you dearly would you welcome the district superintendent of Texas Let us give glory and honor to Jesus. Glory and honor to Jesus. Glory and honor. Glory and honor to Jesus. Thank you very much, uh, Brother. Anthony Mangan, and I want to say to my general superintendent, I love and appreciate you so very much. We worked side by side for many, many years, and I think stepping down as assistant superintendent, I felt like I would be missing him and letting him down more than, than anything. We had uh, so many good times together and shared so many mutual feelings and burdens. And my prayer is with you, my dear General Superintendent. To the men on this platform, I deeply love and appreciate you. All of you have made a great, a great impression upon my heart and life. You have, you have impacted my life. You have given me things that I never could have gotten otherwise. Thank you, Brother Anthony Mangan, for your vision for this. When he first began to talk to me about it, I felt a deep concern, a desire to reach young preachers. And I'll never forget when he and I sat down with our general superintendent, we talked to him about it and how willing Brother Urshan was. Brother Urshan is a great lover of young preachers, and so it was an easy thing for him to give us the backing that we have needed. I really appreciate these 12 years. The 12 years that we've had because of the time, it has been our desire to shape a generation to reach this generation. I never forget that first year God spoke to me, gave me a vision. I wept like I had not wept in a long, long, long time. And I saw young men in a meeting just like this, wall to wall, with their Bibles in front of them. I saw them going in from this place. It was like they were rising up and going through the walls. And they were going into areas where there was a lot of opposition and the beast of Ephesus almost and all of a sudden this became a weapon in their hands Hallelujah. and they were able to defeat every foe that came against them and then I saw others leave this place and go through these walls and go into areas where it was total darkness and all of a sudden this became a light a bright shining light and I literally saw the demon powers leap to get out of the way. And then I saw others leave this place and go through these walls. And they went into areas where it looked impossible. Doors were locked and it just seemed impossible. And all of a sudden, this became a great key in their hands. And they unlocked every door that they came to. So I feel with all of my heart we are in the will of God and things that have happened here through the years, I tell you, God has been with us. We have felt Him. We have enjoyed Him. This is His church and His work and His cause and His kingdom and He's just allowed us to be a little part of it. God bless you. I'm reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 26. Matthew 
Isaiah 26, 31. <clears throat> then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto them, unto him, verily I say unto you, that this night before the cock crow thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. Then cometh Jesus with them into a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tear ye here and watch with me. And he went a little farther, fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away again the second time, prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples, saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed in the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. And I simply want to use, and he went a little farther. And he went a little farther. Would you lift your hands and pray one more time? Praise God. Praise God. <clears throat> Blessed be the Lord. Now clap your hands to the Lord. Bless His holy name. Praise our God. Praise our God. Blessed be the Lord. God bless you. you may be seated. I wonder where the group is seated that is from Australia. Are you able to get inside here? Stand up if you would. I met some wonderful young right here in front of me. It's part of them. Met them in Australia. Met them again yesterday. Those from England. I saw quite a delegation early this morning in the restaurant. England. Way up there. Came all the way to being because of the times. God bless you. There are keys that will unlock your life. If your life is all locked up, if your ministry is all locked up, if your revival is all locked up, if everything seems to be locked up, I've got good news for you. There are keys that will unlock your life. I've, I have found three keys that work on a daily basis for me. The key of repentance. Anytime you fail God, if you're willing to repent and confess, He will have mercy. That's a wonderful thing. The key of forgiveness is one of the most important keys. If you're going to get anything from God, you cannot harbor any feelings against your heart, in your heart, against anybody. 
And so you've got to learn to forgive. Whether they ask you to forgive, that's not your problem. You've got to learn to forgive. And if you live in that spirit and attitude, I can promise you that your life will stay unlocked. And then the third key I learned about 35 years ago, I heard Brother CLDs quote the scripture. 1 Thessalonians 5:18. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So I latched on to that and I turned every defeat in my life into a victory. Uh, some folks have a victory concept. Some have a concept of victory. My victory concept is in everything give thanks. Some folks are ready to be thankful if everything goes all right. But that's not the way it goes. Whatever happens to you, develop a praise concept, a worship concept, an attitude of thanksgiving. And you can keep your life unlocked with those three keys. There are other very important keys in evangelism. The book of Acts, there are two consistent things. You notice when you read through the book of Acts, the work of the Holy Ghost and the work of men who were used by the Holy Spirit of God. You see that over and over and over. The methods of, of evangelism, of course, differed quite a bit. Acts chapter 2, Peter stood up and preached. 3,000 were saved. In Acts 8, Philip went to Samaria and preached. The entire city was filled with joy. And then he was able to go and sit down and preach to one man in a chariot. And that made a big difference. You see the work of evangelism with two that are tied and are in stocks in prison in Acts the 16th chapter. And that certainly was evangelism because an entire household was saved. And uh, of course many, many other ways when you read through the book of Acts. Methods were different. The consistent thing through all of that was the work of the Holy Spirit of God through lives of individuals who were willing to sell out to God and pay the price, whatever it took. Now, goals in evangelism are certainly a wonderful thing. Reach the lost so they'll be saved. Churches can be strengthened. The lukewarm can be stirred. These are three very important things. That's why I like, I left to come to Alexandria. You could take because of the times anywhere in the world and it would not be as effective as it is in this place. You know why? Because these grounds, the very atmosphere, the buildings, and this entire city has been literally saturated with evangelism and with prayer. Prayer every day, prayer every night. I knocked on the door at 2 o'clock. One morning I was passing through and I felt a burden to pray. And a couple of men came and let me in the building. So day and night, day and night, literally saturated. That's why when you get here, there's a spirit of expectancy. There's a spirit of excitement. The grounds have been prepared. The atmosphere has been prepared. The people have been prepared. And if you took this meeting anywhere else, it just would not be as effective. Thank God for those that have paid the price through the years. And we're here just kind of riding on the coattail and, and enjoying what, uh, what is happening. And it's a wonderful thing to know that we could step into an atmosphere like this. And we thank you for that. You will never get a breakthrough in your life, in your church, in your ministry, as long as you feel satisfied and comfortable. There comes that time you just have to break out of the routine. Amen. Be willing to change. And if you never get desperate, you'll never find it. You have to find yourself hungry for God. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. Not maybe so, not hope so, not think so. They shall be filled if you hunger for it, if you want it, if you desire it. 
if you sleep it, if you eat it, if you wake with it, if you talk about it, if you pray about it, if you fast about it, I want to tell you, you can go through any door, you can go through any situation, and God will be there to give you a mighty breakthrough. We'll never get it if we're willing uh, to be satisfied with too little. Malachi's insight was not only for his day, but it was also for our day. They were going through uh, the correct motions, but that's all it was, was motions. And uh, they were offering unto God that that they didn't need, that they didn't want, that that they couldn't sell. And here they're bringing it to the altar, which was the proper thing to do in their worship was come to the altar, but it became such a formality, such a routine. They got caught up in the mundane, and they forgot the real purpose of it all. And it was leftovers. It was things they couldn't use, things they didn't need, things they couldn't sell. And the 8th verse of chapter 1, the Lord said, Why don't you offer it to your governor? Why don't you go give it to him? See if he will accept it. What he's saying at that day and what he's saying to our day, don't be satisfied to go through the routine, the routine of worship. Don't be satisfied to go through the routine of preaching. All, all you have to do every once in a while is break out of your shell. And we're going to do something different. We're going to have revival. We're going to have a spiritual breakthrough. God's going to do something for us. Hallelujah. Glory to God. My, my, my. I, I think one of the most important keys is the spirit of unity. We've heard a lot about it. Are we really willing to go a little farther in unity? I really thought about bringing a, a wash pen up here tonight and washing my superintendent's feet, Brother Mangan's feet. Uh, I wanted to wash Brother Altman's feet after that message this morning. I, I wanted to wash uh, Brother Campos' feet. I just felt like I should have done that. And I, I may do it before this is all over. Praise God. But I'm willing to do anything for unity. You're my brother. You're my sister. You may differ from me. You may have a different attitude about things. You may have a, a different concept of things. But you're my brother. You're my sister. I want to take you by the hand together. Together. Together, we can get the job done. In the book of Acts, you can't help but notice it. Wise men Solomon said, two are better than one. There is good reward for their labor. And they were together in prayer. Prayer is the key. Thank you, Sister Tenney, for that challenging message. Thank you, Sister Mangan. You put me under the altar today. I, I felt like weeping. I don't have enough memorials in my life. I've got too many for myself. I want to go home and build some memorials. Thank you. Prayer is the key. It was in Acts 3. It was in Acts 4. They were together in prayer. Acts 12, they were together in prayer. When missionaries were sent out in Acts 13, they were together in prayer. Prayer strengthens. Prayer purifies. Prayer satisfies. Prayer qualifies. Don't ever stop praying. We've got to be together in prayer. That's the only way you'll ever develop a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is through prayer. You can be stirred with a message. You can read your Bible, and that's good. Oh, well and good. But until you take time out, some time or another in your life, 
to say, I'm going to stay here until I get a personal touch from God. I'm going to stay right here until I know that he's speaking to my heart. You'll never amount to two cents. But once you can develop a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, let me tell you, you can be like the Apostle Paul. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. My dear little wife is here tonight. I appreciate and love her so very much. If she hadn't have loved me, she would have left me the first year we were married. You see, I knew all there was to know about Pentecost. And she was not raised in a preacher's home. And I was constantly, every day, telling her, you can't do this, you've got to do that. And she stayed with me, the miracle of it all. But, you know, in those early years, we just made up our mind. We were going to walk with God. Every Monday was fast day. Every Wednesday was fast day. Every Friday was fast day. And I tried to slip around to do it at times. She said, no, if you're fasting, I'm going to fast too. I looked forward in those days to having a headache three days a week. I knew that I was going to have it. In those days, I fasted and had a headache, splitting headache. But when Wednesday came, I had another headache. When Friday came, I had another headache. But when I stepped in that little pulpit with those few people that I pastored, I, I felt a heartache. There was something that went from a headache to a heartache, and it reached out. And God bless me, I don't know how, I don't know why, but he did. But during those days of our early ministry, we developed a beautiful relationship with the Lord. And it's not always what it should be, but I can point back to those days and say, we went a little further. We wanted to have it. We were determined we're going to have it. We were going to have a bigger Sunday school. We were going to have a greater revival. We were going to have a move of God. What I'm saying, don't be satisfied with too little. Make up your mind. I may have a little church, but it's going to be the best little church in the city. Hallelujah. I really feel that the United Pentecostal Church is so close, so close to a nationwide revival that's going to sweep across the world. I just feel that we're so close. We're so close that I'm afraid I'm going to miss it. That's why I'm here. I want somebody to preach to me. I want somebody to pray with me. I want an elder to lay their hand on me. If you're a young preacher here, don't you leave without an elder laying his hand on you and praying for you. I just feel with all of my heart that we are reaching for something that we have believed in all of these years. Now the devil knows that. And he's going to get all of his hordes together, all of his forces of hell, to try to stop it. But by the help and grace of God, we're going to be together in prayer. We're going to be together in purpose. We're going to be together in perseverance. We're going to be together in praise. We're going to be together in promise. We're going to be together in unity. We are determined we're going to break down those walls. We're going to beat down those barriers. We are going to be together in a spirit of unity. I know if we can love one another like we need to love each other, let me tell you, we haven't begun to see what God will do in this hour. got to have it. 39 years ago, as I began to pastor my church, 
I told them we will never have anything happen around here until we're united. Two years, no one had received the Holy Ghost. Two years, no one had been baptized. I kept the baptistry filled. I kept it cleaned out because I knew it was going to happen. But I just kept preaching to them. You've got to love each other. You've, forgot to, you've got to forgive the things that happened in the past. You've even got to ask forgiveness for some things. Or you can just close the door. We're not going to have revival. I kept preaching it. I brought it in my Bible lessons. It was in Sunday morning message. It was in evangelism Sunday night. I kept hammering away until finally they began to believe it. And they would come and say, Brother Kilgore, I felt that God spoke to me to go and make some things right. I said, thank you, Jesus. We're on our way. Amen. And I'll never forget that week that I was determined that I was going to have a breakthrough. And you've heard it before. I'll tell you again. I pulled myself up into the attic of our church, just a little small square. I put a chair and stood on the top of it. And as I was pulling myself up, I knocked it out of the way because I didn't want anybody to know where I was. I was up in that attic on a slope between the ceiling and the roof, and it was hot. And I began to pray, and I began to cry. And uh, through the day, I heard different ones calling for me. My wife said, I heard you somewhere groaning, but I couldn't find you. I said, I didn't want anybody to find me. I was trying to die. And it took me seven hours to finally breathe the last breath of self and give myself to God completely. When I swung out of that ceiling that evening and dropped to the floor, there wasn't a dry stitch of clothes. My hair was messed up. My face was swollen. My eyes were red. But I had just left something behind. And I had obtained something. I felt it here. I knew it was going to happen the very next Sunday night. A man that had been seeking the baptism over 12 years received the Holy Ghost. That was a breakthrough. The next few weeks, 52 brand new people received the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, there is a breakthrough. There is a breakthrough. You can have a breakthrough. You can have a move of God. You can have a victory. You can have a revival. It all depends. Am I willing to go just a little bit farther? But all my Texas brethren stand. All my brethren from Texas. Remain standing a moment. You elected me. Not a one of you could say, Brother Kilgore told me to vote for him. Not a one of you could say, I know that he'll accept it because he said he would. To the contrary, I told everybody that asked me, you'll probably lose your vote if you vote for me. I don't owe any political debt to anybody. But I'm going to tell you, brethren, standing here tonight, I don't intend to let you go to sleep. I may be superintendent one more year, but I'm going to stretch you. I'm going to pull you. I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm to direct you. I'm going to tell you that we're going to have revival in every heart, every home, every church, and eventually in every village, every city in the state of Texas. I'm not going to let you go to sleep. And I know that you're not going to let me go to sleep. This is our finest hour. This is our greatest day. Brethren, we can have it if we will pull together. If we will work together.
We are so close to a breakthrough. Now, you'll never get a breakthrough without taking a risk. You've got to suffer the idea that you may be misunderstood. You may suffer some ridicule. Somebody may say, what does he think he's doing? You, you've got to get ready for that. You've got to take a risk. There have been young men that have gone back to their churches with their wives from because of the times. And they were so impressed with the singing and the praise worship that they went to their churches that had never had that and they started it. Some of the folks were not used to it. They thought the young pastor and his wife was tearing things up. And some of them actually left and went to another church. But they took a risk. And they're having revival today. One man, one man went home and had revival after he left because of the times. I saw him about six months later. He said, Brother Kilgore, it looks like the revival is going to split my church. He said, folks that have been there for a long time and have positions are afraid the new ones coming in are going to get their position. That's a risk you have to take. But I'm going to tell you, for every one you lose with that attitude, God has five more that will come. Hallelujah. You have to take a risk. That's a key that will unlock your life. Dare to step out. Amen. I love this man. Come here, Brother Mannion. I wish some of you would rub off on me. You know, this is, this pull, is a... Pull, a, pull over and park here a while. Okay, I'll, yes. I'll do that. I need to come and live here a while. I'm going to tell you, this is one man you could praise and compliment to the high heavens. And he just grin a little bit. And you could ridicule him and make fun of him. And he just grinned a little bit. I had that too. Doesn't make any difference. No, no, we didn't. But every preacher here wishes they could get up and... When I was in Bible school, Brother and Sister Mangan came and preached two revivals. And uh, the last revival, he preached on the, the sound of the trumpet. i never forget it. Uh, let me hold on to you. He stood there on one foot like the Lord was fixing to raise up the other foot. For five minutes, he preached off of one foot. Every young preacher that left there tried standing on one foot. They wanted to be like Brother Mangan. But you know what they did one night? That thing was tied up. No outsiders coming. Sister Mangan got her accordion. Brother Mangan got his Bible. And they led that entire church out of the building and around that big block. And people turned their porch lights on. They came out to see what it was all about. But I want you to know it broke a revival. People came and received the Holy Ghost. I'm just saying, you've got to be willing to take a risk. Glory! Be willing to go just a little bit farther. Don't be satisfied with the status quo. And don't say, I can't have it at my place. Don't let your location affect your consecration and your destination and the destination of souls. 
God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Glory! There to take a risk. There to step out a little further. There to believe God. And I'm telling you, it can happen. It can happen. And I want to tell you something else. You better change your thinking. You know, the first church that my dad built, he went into a town that had a big sign at the edge of the town. Two classes of people were not welcome there. No holy rollers. And then the slur word for black people. Brother, we're in this together. I'm telling you right now, we're in this together. We're in this together. I love my black brethren. Is Richard Rose here tonight? Where is Richard Rose? If he's not here, he ought to be ashamed. He took me. He's a great big bruiser. Baptist preacher. I took him down into the water in Jesus' name, and I thought I'd never get him up. But he's the only preacher that I ever raised up that took me to the store and bought me a new suit, and I'm wearing it. He bought me a necktie and a shirt. I'll probably have 40 next conference. <laughs> but I want to tell you, brethren, this is the greatest day for us to work hand in hand with our Hispanic brethren, with our black brethren. We've got to take each other by the hand. Glory to God. Hallelujah. This is our day. This is our day. Get to thinking. We don't have to always. I'm going to say it. Be seated. I'm going to say it. We have too much of a bargain basement syndrome. For too many years we have thought because we are apostolic we need to stay down in the basement. And I guess I can use myself as an example. Brother and Sister Mangan were preaching the meeting there in Tulsa and I had to go be examined for the army. In those days when you had prayer requests, everybody in the building stood and expressed their request. I stood up that night and I said, everybody, pray for me. I'm going to be examined for the army tomorrow. And that congregation broke out laughing. Isn't that right, Sister Mangan? She found me in a corner later that night and encouraged me. But you see, I was four feet, ten and a half inches tall and weighed 92 pounds. And they looked at me like I was still a little kid, and the very idea that I would tell folks, pray for me, I'm going to be examined for the army. But for five years, I had not grown a fraction of an inch and had not gained a half a pound. We had a quartet, Brother Orlin Foss, Brother... Roland Gardner, Brother uh, John David Williams, the four of us. The three of them went to Brown Duncan Department Store, went upstairs and bought their suits because it seemed the proper thing, if you're going to have a quartet, dress alike. So I took one of those suits that they were buying down into the basement to the boys' department. Here I was, a grown man, shopping in the boys' department. 
they went upstairs, and I went, where? Downstairs. And I'd been going downstairs for five years. You know, that was my fate. I can resign to the fact that I'm never going to grow, and I'm always going to be in the basement. Or I can just start thinking. I don't have to always be under a hundred pounds. Amen. So I got to thinking about it. And I got to believing it. I got to having them stretch me. That's the truth. I held on to the bedstead and Brother Orrin Ray Foss and another big bruiser pulled my legs. That's right. When you want to grow, you'll do anything. I stood on my tiptoes to sing with those three fellas. But I went to bed every night dreaming I'm going to wake up in the morning and be six foot tall. I went to prayer and I said, oh God, let me grow. I thought about it. I ate it. I slept it. I lived it. I wanted it. I talked about it. I kept thinking in my mind all the things I'm going to do when I walk upstairs. Amen. And you know, when I went to be examined, the doctor said you have leakage of the heart, and that's why your growth is stunted. Up until then, I didn't know what was wrong. And Dr. P.G. Murray said, you have to be careful, you could fall over dead. When I went back to that same church, Sister Mangan, and told them, they didn't, they didn't laugh that time. They started getting under a burden. They prayed for me. I couldn't tell you when it happened, who it was that prayed the prayer of faith, but I do know that I woke up one morning and I had grown a little. And I woke up another morning and I'd grown a little more. And I woke up another morning, and I grew a little more. That first year, I grew a little over six inches. So what did I do? I just climbed up out of that basement. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Preacher. Let me tell you, you can have the bargain basement syndrome with the feeling because of my standard, because of my message. I'll always have to stay in the basement. Nothing good can ever happen. I'm here to tell you, you need to kick the traces. You need to elbow your way. You need to claw. You need to fight. You need to run. You need to wrestle. You need to make up your mind. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to have a move of God. <laughs> Glory. Some of you have come to this conference. Let's stand together. You have come to this conference with the feeling I never get the breaks. You have to have a certain name to get what you need. The only name you need is Jesus. You just need to make up your mind. I'm going to go a little further. I, I'm going to break out of my shell. I'm going to go home and believe God like never before. I'm going to leave you with this. All you need to do is these days renew your desire. Make up your mind. Wake up your faith. Break up your will. Take up your cross and you'll see what God can do for you. I feel the Holy Ghost here. I feel the Spirit of God moving here. I want to see a preacher that will take hold of this and say, I'm going to climb up 
I'm going to get out of my shell. I'm going to believe God. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. Close your eyes. Oh. My Lord. Thank you, Jesus. For I have called you for this very hour. I am your God. You are my people. I will not leave you by yourself. I promised that I would go with you all the way. And I ask you this night to dare to reach out to me, to claim my promises, and step out on faith. And I will meet you more than halfway. I will satisfy the deep longing of your soul. And I will fill your heart with joy and gladness because I am the Lord and I change not. And I have promised and I will not fail to fulfill my promise.